Hello everyone and welcome back to another reaction to the unbiased history of Rome. The, today we're doing part 3, which is about the Roman Republic. Without further ado, let's get going. Welcome back, plebs. I'm glad to say that we'll finally talk about the Res Publica, more specifically, of the two great heroes of the early Republic. You know, just in case you need proof that great man history is correct. <clears throat> John Green. Ah, yes. Um, now, with regards to great man history, I believe there is a compromise position. Certainly, we have to recognize that there have been individuals, like uh, on the list here, Genghis Khan, Caesar, Napoleon, Jesus, Hitler. Yeah, there have been individuals that have undoubtedly shaped history alone. However, we also have to recognize that events uh, shape history. And by that I mean, for example, Napoleon. Um, C was certainly an extraordinary individual who definitely changed the face of Europe forever, the course of European history. No doubt in my mind about that. However, it was the French Revolution itself that allowed Napoleon to rise through the ranks and become Emperor of the French in the first place. So, you know, I believe there's a compromise position. Uh, obviously, these individuals did not uh, do everything alone. They had subordinates, they had people around them. So yeah, we can't forget about those people either. But I do not dismiss great man theory completely. That's just my two cents. Great. It was 509 BC and a map of the world looked like this. Then we have the Mediterranean and then Italy. At the heart of Latium we have Rome. Now the Respublica. Respublica. Okay, Republic. The center of the civilized and now democratic. Yes, the uh, Respublica literally means public thing. And of course, that is the wor where the word Republic comes from, uh, if that wasn't obvious already world. The further away you got from it, the shittier it got. Should be intuitive by now. I could go on and on over how the Republic worked. It's a work of art. But here's a summary. The man voted, woman, kids, immigrants, and slaves didn't. Yes. Uh, yes. So the Roman voting system, a brief summary of that would be that it, it was extremely convoluted and uh, it was stacked in favor of the rich quite heavily uh, for the patricians, but also for the equestrians, which were sort of equivalent knights. They were sort of semi-nobility, semi you could call them. And of course, only Roman citizens had a right to vote. And uh, as they say, non-voters would be uh, women and uh, slaves and freedmen and foreigners and, you know, all others. So only Roman male citizens had a right to vote. A man, the richer you were, the stronger your vote. The cursus honorum went from quaestors, aediles, praetors, and consuls. Yes, uh, the cursus honorum is, you could call it the ladder of offices, uh, which every man of senatorial rank aspired to climb. So you started at the quaestorship, and the quaestors were, you could describe them as financial officers uh, in the city of Rome itself, but also in the provinces. And sometimes they served as second in command in the provinces, and they could also be financial officers in the legions. And, uh, well, uh, our friend Doverty here <laughs> describes uh, Caesars as a mock office for aspiring plebs, which, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was not that prestigious, I would agree with that. Um, Aediles, where patricians that just want to chill go, uh, yeah. <laughs> Adels, uh, their primary duty was to oversee public works, temples and markets. They would also organize uh, water and food supplies, especially if you were Adile in the city of Rome. And, of course, they organized games. That was the most important part of the office of Adile. And uh, that granted the... If they successfully staged uh, a spectac spectacular games, um, that meant that the Aediles could uh, gain Dignitas. Now, Dignitas is a uniquely Roman concept which denotes uh, a mix of prestige, charisma, uh, power and personal respect. And it was very important to accrue Dignitas. And that is, uh, Aediles were a good office to do that. Uh, praetorship, 
where the wise men stand. Um, well, they could basically command legions and garrisons under certain circumstances. And they were also the chief judicial officers of the Republic. And uh, in certain circumstances, they could also serve as governor of provinces. Um, yeah. And that's about, that covers the praetorships. Uh, of course, the consulships, perhaps the most famous office of the Republic. Um, and the most prestigious office, at least during the Republic, not the Empire. And basically, uh, the consuls were, there were two of them, they were elected for one year terms, and they were the supreme commanders of the armies, and they were the executive power of Rome, and they had the power to, they had the power and duty to enforce laws, and of course, uh, they could propose their own legislation, um, but yeah, this was a very powerful position, but it was checked by the fact that it was a one year term, and that the, your fellow consul could veto you. Well, at least in theory. Uh, yeah. So, that covers it. Censors also existed, tribunes as well. Ah, yes. Some additional offices, censors. Um, they were uh, responsible for maintaining the census, uh, obviously. They also sub supervised public morality. And uh, they had some certain governmental financial duties. Uh, Tribune of the Plebs was a uniquely uh, unique office because it was exclusive to the plebeians. And uh, all you need to know about the Tribune of the Plebs is that they had the power to veto uh, legislation. And uh, that was a very powerful office uh, that stopped many uh, patrician uh, le legislative proposals throughout the Republic. Well, and the Pontifex Maximus had the best name. Historically yes, Pontifex Maximus was essentially the chief priest of Rome, and the name has, the title rather, has continued to live on throughout history and has eventually been adopted by the Pope himself. Uh, he has a variation of this title these days. So yeah, that's an interesting tidbit. Historia Civilis covers it all. Here we will focus not on the offices, but the enemies of the Republic. They fit into two groups. In war times, there were the barbarians. Of Ancient course. enemies of civilization, rape, kill, destroy, we know them well by now. In peacetime, however, there were the plebs, Rome's lazy masses, always bitching at the patricians for the pettiest of reasons. It wasn't enough that Publius... Yeah, I mentioned last time that the plebeians would be in a power struggle with the patricians over rights and privileges. And I was not joking about that. And the others have freedom from the Tarquins. Barely a decade later, they were already committing mass treason, fucking off to the Sacred Mountain, refusing to enlist for Rome's defense. To appease those traitors, the patricians began to gradually grant the plebs more and more of a political voice. It would eventually destroy the Republic, but hey, what did you expect with plebs in charge? Despite these concessions, the plebs just kept bitching for more and more, neither satisfied or grateful. A patrician named Queso had just about enough of it. As a descendant of the Albans Tullus had brought into Rome from Alba Longa, Queso actively participated in not letting yet another city be ruined. His actions triggered the revolt in the Capitoline Hill, which killed the consul of the year, Publicola, Ooh. that is Publicola's son. Such was the regard plebs held for Roman heroes. In his place, the Senate elected Queso's father as Suffet consul. Lucius Quintus. Yes, uh, a Suffolk consul was a consul that had been elected during the year. So if an ordinary consul resigned or died, a Suffolk consul would be elected to serve out the rest of the term. It was not as prestigious, but you know, it gave. Uh, the man elected to the office, the same dignity. Uh, so it was still a great thing to be elected Suffolk Consul. Cincinnatus. I could go forever about this man, but his story speaks for itself. As yes, Cincinnatus is a very legendary figure in Roman history, and I think Doherty will explain exactly why. As consul, Cincinnatus refused to give a single inch to the plebeian demands, ending his consulship and retiring to his small farm. The plebs, of course, refused to shut their mouths, abusing their newly acquired political powers to falsely frame Queso with murder charges, who exiled himself out of pure disgust. A common practice, as we'll see. And so the plebs went after his father, fining Cincinnatus for all the money he had, forcing him to live in a tiny little patch of dirt, which he did, with no complaints. Meanwhile, the barbarous Aquis tried to retake Tusculum from Rome, encircling the small consular army sent to fight them. In such times of need, the senate would temporarily elect dictators or something. Yes, and um, nowadays the title of dictator has very negative connotations. Back then it didn't have uh, quite the same uh, meaning as it does now. 
And the office of dictator was a legitimate office of the Republic. It was only used very sparingly in times of uh, national emergency. And during these cases, they would appoint a dictator to serve for maximum six months. And during that time, they had absolute undisputed power over the Roman Republic. And uh, so, yes, the dictatorship, however, would become a more and more abused office. Eventually, it was abolished after Julius Caesar's death. But we'll get there in a future video. The crisis. Elected as such, since Natus accepted his duty. Bar his toga, kissed his wife, went to Rome, drafted the plebs, crushed Rome's enemies, renounced the dictatorship, and went back to his farm. All in two weeks. Pretty based, if I might say. But it doesn't end it there. It is based. Decades later, a wannabe tyrant began bribing the plebs for supporting his claim to be king. Also a common practice, which we will definitely see more of. To stop him, the Senate elected since Natus dictator again. Now 80 fucking years old. He accepted. Bar his toga, kissed his wife, what a went man. to Rome, drafted the plebs, crushed Rome's enemies, renouncing the dictatorship, and went back to his farm, but this time it took three weeks. He wasn't in his prime anymore. Few Roman heroes can compare to Cincinnatus in Rome. Yes, he's right. Uh, Cincinnatus is a re was a revered Roman uh, figure who exemplified the, um, uh, you know, public service. Uh, he, whenever Rome called upon him, he did his duty, and he resigned, went back to his cabbage farm, whatever, and uh, when they Republic called upon him once again, he did his work, then he resigned, went back to his farm, and he did uh, nothing more and nothing less than was expected of him, a true a Roman hero, as we would say. Virtue, one of which happened to be born just a few decades later. With yet another plebe revolt crushed, the patricians could resume Rome's mission of spreading civilization, starting with Vei, long since a Roman enemy. To crush them once and for all, command of the Roman legions was granted to the greatest Roman general of the time, Marcus Furius Camillus. Now that's a clan name right there. Leading the war effort. Yes, Camillus is a sort of legendary, semi-legendary figure in Roman history. Um, although... Modern scholars think that most of the things attributed to him are either exaggerated or uh, misattributed even. It should have been attributed to someone else. Or even outright fictional. Still, Camillus is an important figure. So let's see what he did. Effort. Camillus defeated Supposedly. all of his allies, laying siege to the city for years, breaching it and annihilating the population. Such is a fate reserved for Rome's rivals. It's fitting, then, that the victorious Roman soldiers received their first salary that day, Vei Delendaist. Rome was now the undisputed leader of Latium, having subdued the entire Latin League years back, but defeating Vei posed the question of what to do with the land and loot. Camillus refused to let the plebs take the hard-won earnings, much less allow them to infest Vei. Instead, he gifted much of the treasures and lands as tribute to the gods. A wise choice, not that religious duty was something that plebs I'm sure Jupiter that was pleased. their power to lay false charges on Camillus, forcing him into exile. In their rage, the gods sought to punish the plebs. Enter the Gauls. Easily uh, one of the most the violent Gauls. barbarian hordes, topped only by one. Having destroyed all of Central Europe, they... Yes, the Gauls would remain a thorn in Rome's side for centuries. Um, until, certain, again, <laughs> and you notice how we're coming back to Julius Caesar all the time. Um, you know, great man theory and all that. Yeah, Caesar would crush the Gauls, but they would come back, you know, uh, long, you know, many, many times to harass Rome. They began to invade the Etruscan held Italy, a bastion of civilization compared to them. <laughs> yeah. They raised their way down south until the leader of the Senone tribe, Brennus, came in contact with Roman ambassadors. They asked him why he was destroying everything, only to accuse the Romans of doing the same. They explained that what they really did was to spread civilization, which. Yes, of course. The Romans were just civilizing, you know. Um... I don't understand why anyone would take offense to the Romans bringing civilization to your barbarian lands. I mean, well, I must be some strange people to object to that. Which triggered Brennus beyond belief, declaring war on them on the spot. The Senate saw this as a chance to finally teach the plebs to fight on their own. The pleb legions met with the Gauls in battle and broke in seconds, fleeing to Vei figures. With no army on the field, the patricians could only sigh as Gaul invaded the city, killing, raping, and burning everything on sight. Sounds familiar? It's hard to say who I blame most for this. Thankfully, the core of the city held firm, being manned by the patrician soldiers. Yeah, so Rome was not sacked many times throughout its history, and uh, it would be a long time before it was sacked again after this. So, yeah, whenever Rome gets sacked, you know, it's pretty dire. Great. 
conspiracy of state behind. Still in exile, Camillus was furious when he learned of the invasion, accepting the election as dictator and raising a new army. Meanwhile, unable to fully take the city, Brennus met with the senators, demanding them to pay him to leave, so that he could have an excuse to claim victory. But when a senator pointed out that the gold balance was rigged, Brennus left, saying, why wig this? Meaning, gives me that. It was then that Camillus arrived, his mere presence making the Gauls shit themselves. Once explained the situation, Camillus left, pulling out his massive dick, breaking oh, the damn. scale, and telling the barbarians to fuck off back to their mud huts. Brennus couldn't hold his greed anymore, trying to take the, the gold sight of his manhood. Away, only to hear behind him. Scared him away. No one knows exactly what happened to the Gauls that day, only that they were all gone. It was a victory, but a costly one. The plebs wished to migrate to Vei, but Camillus shunned their laziness. The gods had appointed them with a divine mission, and in Rome was where it was to be undertaken. Personally leading the reconstruction effort, Camillus ensured Rome would not share in Troy's fate, becoming its second founder and a hero forever. Alright, who's keeping tabs? I think Camillus has the new record. Stick around to see how long it lasts. But of course, the he stars in the audience already know how long it lasts. The next chapter will be all about the Latin and Semite Wars. Together Ah, yes, next episode will be about the Latin and Semite Wars, a very crucial phase of the Republic, and where Rome turned from this, you know, thriving but still small community into a regional power on the Ita Italian peninsula. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in that episode, but uh, yeah, if you have anything to add, please leave a comment, please like the video course subscribe if you want more and i'll see you guys in the next video